Thank you very much. Uh, we are so delighted to have all of you joining into this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good day, good evening. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation to join this webinar. This is a joint venture between uh, the International Livestock Research Institute and Venture 37. It is the fourth uh, webinar that we are having uh, in a series that we've been doing since 2021. And uh, we're very delighted that we have this opportunity to present today. My name is Esther Njuguna Mungai. I'm a senior scientist working on gender here at ILRI and I'm going to be your facilitator today. So as we join, uh, kindly feel free to use the chat function to tell us who you are, to tell us where you're joining from, and also maybe what you do at the organization. And kindly remember to mute uh, your, your mic uh, if you're not speaking. We will do that, but it, just in case you find that your mic is on, kindly put it off. If you have trouble hearing our presentations, kindly uh, you can sign out and sign back in. And if the problem persists, we suggest that maybe you can talk to your tech support for that. And just to note that we are recording the session today, we would like to archive it in the ERI website and the, in the Venture 37 website. And so uh, we are recording the audio, the video and the chat. And please note that even the private chats will be visible to the organizers. Uh, we are also live tweeting. And if you want to join in the live tweets, that would be very, very great. And if you have any questions, any comments that come during the presentations, kindly feel free to raise them in the chat. We have a team that will be looking at the chat, answering them and responding on the chat. And some of those questions will also be uh, part of the highlight of the policy discussion. So today we have a webinar that is organized into three main sessions. If I don't talk about the question and answer, uh, we have an introduction piece uh, that will be coming from, the, uh, from our colleague and friend, Dr. Jemai Manjuki and uh, she will be anchoring our conversation through an introductory piece. And we do have three case studies that are coming from, uh, from Ethiopia, uh, one from Ghana, and one that will come from India. The third one is special because it will be our entry into the policy discussion. And so th uh, that will be the lineup. After we have that, we will have a policy roundtable uh, where we will be uh, discussing with uh, Vicky and uh, Jemima and asking questions and the contribution will also be coming from our, our audience. So our webinar today is entitled Women in Livestock, uh, Breaking Gender Biases, Shifting Norms, How to Support More Women to Profit from Their Livestock Enterprise. Social norms are increasingly being accepted and appreciated as a deep-seated, if not the the beneath the service thing uh, that is underlying causes the hindrances of meaningful and positive change for more members of, of, of society. Uh, when we talk about social norms, uh, usually the women and girls are usually the ones that are mostly affected uh, negatively in most of the communities. These are rules they are, they are of, of, that are, could be informal or they could also be formal. And norms uh, become a very important part of our conversation in research and development. And we hope that today's conversation will help us focus on women in livestock and what some of the norms that they are dealing with in different programs in different countries and how uh, we're making progress in that area. So it is my singular pleasure and privilege to introduce to us Dr. Jemai Manjuki. And uh, Jemima is uh, currently the chief at the Economic Empowerment Program at the UN Women. Uh, she's a recognized leader of gender equality and women's empowerment, having directed global initiatives promoting women's economic empowerment. She has spent the last two years leading the UN Food System Summit on gender equality and women's en empowerment level of change and was instrumental in establishing the coalition to make food systems work for women and girls. So Jemima, if you're able to join us kindly, this is your moment. Thank you very much, uh, Esther, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, unfortunately, I had some challenges with my sound, so I'm joining you on my phone, and I hope you can hear me and you can see me. If you can just confirm that, Esther, before I go on. Yes, I can see you, and I believe our, our participants can see you and we can hear you well. And um, sorry about that challenge. 
Fantastic, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for, for having me uh, today. And it's such a bittersweet moment for me because, as you said, although I have moved to UN Women to um, head the economic empowerment work, you know my roots are in livestock. Actually, I spent the better times of my career working at uh, Irori on gender and livestock issues. Um, so this is such a, an honor for me to be able to come back and actually uh, talk to you and participate in this, in this webinar. Um, so I wanted to address two, two big fundamental questions in my introductory remarks. Um, so the first one is how we can address these structural causes of gender inequality, including norms, while at the same time making sure that we are meeting the needs and practical realities of, um, of, of women. And the second question that I really want us to, to, to focus on is how do we then change norms and how do we know that um, norms are changing? So let me start with the, with the, with the first one. And what I'm going to do is um, use some of our work at UN Women to illustrate some of the points that I'm going to make. So how do we address these structural causes of gender inequality that we know are persistent? Um, they are systemic, they are built into our cultures, they are built into our institutions, they are built into our politics, while at the same time making sure that we really are addressing the critical realities of women and girls today, because one of the things that I keep saying, and especially now sitting at, um, at the UN at, and at the UN agency uh, that's responsible, that has the mandate for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, is to really ask our, you know, it's to realize the urgency of, of what we need to do, that women and girls around the world cannot wait anymore. I have persistently said um, women and girls are doing their, their part. And we as agencies, we as change makers really need to do our part to make sure that systems work for women and girls. So how do we address then these long-term systemic issues while making sure that we are still prioritizing the needs and priorities of women and girls? And there are four key areas that I think we need to be, um, we need to be working on alongside um, each other. The first one is on strengthening women's voice and agency. And often we say that women's voices are not present, whether we are talking about livestock policies, whether we are talking about broader food systems policies and processes. The women's voices are not present, but we actually know women are speaking. You go to communities, women are very clear about what their priorities are. They're very clear about what their needs are, but those voices are not always heard. So how do we ensure that women's voices are actually heard, that they are being heard in the right, um, in the right places, that those voices are magnified in a way that we can no longer um, ignore them? One of the things that I, um, I was very passionate about and that I spent a lot of my time working on the last couple of years, a uh, couple of months, about 18 months, is the UN Food System Summit. And I'm sure a lot of you that are listening um, heard about the UN Food System Summit and the processes leading up to the UN Food System Summit. And one of the things that we were really keen to make sure we do is ensure that women's leadership, women's voices are heard and are present in food systems organizations that are really playing a critical role in governing food systems. And so we started what's called the Global Food 5050. And the Global Food 5050 is an accountability mechanism to hold food systems organizations accountable. And I mean, and here I use organizations very liberally to mean any organization, whether government, private sector company, donor agency, 
that is dealing with food systems. And, and this accountability mechanism, it's an index. We launched the first one during the Food System Summit in September uh, last year. It looks at four key issues around gender equality in food systems organizations. First is the leadership. Who are the leaders in these food systems organizations? And our first report actually showed only 6% of the leaders CEOs, board chairs in food systems organizations are women from uh, low and middle income countries. So doing really, really poorly in terms of, um, of women's leadership. The second area that we then looked at is the policies. How many policies? Um, do organizations have policies around parental leave, around the things that are important for, for women, around equal pay for work of equal, um, equal value? And the third area was on the outcomes that these organizations um, have. Are they collecting data on the impacts they have on women and, um, and, and, and girls? And the, and, and the fourth area really just looking at the overall commitment of the organization to gender equality. Is it highlighted in their strategic, um, in their strategic plans, in their goals, in their visions that gender equality and the empowerment of women is a critical area? So this is around building women's agency. And, and, and building women's, uh, women's voice. We hope that through these accountability mechanisms that food systems organizations can actually remain true to what um, they're saying around the importance of gender equality in food systems. The second area, um, I talked about four key areas. The second area is on increasing access to resources. And, and this is usually where a lot of focus has been, you know, making sure women have information, they have skills. We will have case studies today showing how organizations, how partners are increasing access to livestock, um, to livestock uh, vaccines to, to, and, and, and other resources. It's making sure women have access to finance and not just finance, but finance that actually works for them, that's designed to meet their needs needs and, um, and priorities. Um, the third area is on policies and institutions, because we have to have this overarching legal framework that is actually supportive of women, um, of, of women and girls, but also making sure that our institutions, whether those are governance institutions, market institutions, cooperatives, any institutions that are operating within the food systems um, space, that they actually are responsive to the needs and priorities of women, that their processes, their legal bearing actually allows for women's participation, engagement, and benefits. And the fourth area, which is the topic of this particular webinar, is on changing harmful gender and social, um, social norms. And we know how critical this is, that the, the norms around what uh, women and girls are, what is their place in society, what they can do and cannot do, what they can own and cannot own, um, what is their place, where, where their voices are allowed, where they're not allowed. All those issues then impact on women directly, but they also impact on, um, on, on food security. So fundamental questions around why are women producing food on land that they do not um, do not own? What are the barriers? And we know those barriers are both legal barriers, they're both policy barriers, legal framework barriers, but a lot of them are also social norm barriers around um, what women are allowed to own and not own. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed about working at Eori and working on livestock is we used to say livestock is probably one of the biggest assets that in a lot of communities women are actually allowed to own, whether that's poultry, whether that's um, um, small ruminants with that uh, large, um, large livestock. So it's really an important pathway uh, for women's access to, to, to assets. So those are the four key areas that I think we really need to be focusing on. Now, 
one one thing I would like to say about these four key areas is we need to work on them alongside each other, as I mentioned. Um, the, the reason why women's uh, voices are unheard in communities, in legal processes, has to do with, with norms. So you cannot actually strengthen the voices of women without also addressing the norms that govern the spaces where women's voices need to, to be heard. Increasing access to resources. If we need women to have land, a lot of those barriers are legal, as I said, and, and social norms barriers. So we cannot really increase women's access to land, women's access to finance um, without addressing um, norms and without addressing policies. One of the best illustrations that I use to show the connections between these things is around the work we do at UN Women on, um, on care. And at the moment, we are working with ILO on a joint program on addressing, we, we using what we call the 5R framework, the reducing, recognizing, redistributing, remunerating, and representing when it comes to, 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 to care work. And this is a very good illustration that um, some of this uh, work, we really need to approach it from a very, very holistic um, perspective. So in terms of recognizing um, and redistributing um, care work, um, we are working very much at the policy level to get governments uh, to actually include universal care, the provision of universal care as part of their macroeconomic policies, as part of their um, Fiscal, fiscal policies, so providing them with tools to actually assess the cost of uh, providing universal care, but also to look at what are the benefits uh, that accrue to a country by uh, providing universal care, because the provision of universal care is not just a cost to government, but it is actually um, a revenue, a revenue stream, because what governments then do is they create care jobs, they integrate care into the formal economy with substantive changes to their, to their GDPs because they basically expand the employment, um, the employment uh, base. So these are very practical tools that then we're working with about 30 governments around the world actually to, to, to show that there is, it makes economic sense to include uh, issues of care in their uh, in their macroeconomic policies. Um, so that's the recognition, but also the redistribution bit uh, of, of, of unpaid care, because you then are redistributing the care work between individuals and the, and the, and the state. Um, the second uh, thing in terms of increasing access to, to resources is reducing care work. And this is where access to technologies, access to services um, is critically uh, important. And then we have added two R's to the care um, framework. One, to look at the agency, the representation of domestic care workers in policies. Um, and, and this sort of takes us into the realm of, of, of not just unpaid care work, but paid care work, because we also know that and, uh, even uh, within formal employment, paid care work is still not considered decent jobs. The policies that are governing it, the, the, the pay structure um, is still not uh, what it should, it should be. And so there we're talking a lot about representation and how domestic workers, care workers should be represented in, in policy uh, processes. And of course, then talking about 
the, the, the norms bit of it. How do you use men as champions of change to redistribute, uh, to redistribute care work within households, to have more equitable sharing of care work within, within households, and not just care work, but also the domestic, other domestic work that's so important um, for the survival of communities, survival of households and, and, and countries. So this four, um, four way framework of um, strengthening women's voice and agency, increasing access to resources, addressing um, policies and institutions, and addressing social norms is really a framework that can be applied across any context. You can apply it to a livestock context. I have just applied it to the Con, uh, context of um, addressing unpaid and um, unpaid care work and my expectation is that as organizations we start looking at social norms from a holistic perspective that even as we address social norms um, we are not addressing social norms as an end in itself but we are addressing social norms so that we strengthen women's voice and agency so that we increase women's access to resources and and rights and their rights to um, to resources and that we improve their um, their livelihoods. So the the second question I said I would address is on how we change norms. And I think I I, I know um, our case studies today are going to address that. So I won't dwell too much on that. But I didn't want to leave without saying um, this and mainly because uh, Italy is a research organization um, you, and, and other research organizations represented here have a critical role to play in helping us measure social norm change. When do we know that norms um, have changed? I think that remains a critical question um, for you all. We are measuring this using individual changes in attitude, but we want to be able to tell what is that tipping point for when norm change happens in a way that it doesn't, they do not revert back. Is it a, do we need to get to a critical mass of, of individual people that actually change their attitudes towards gender equality? Is it our institutions reforming in ways that um, that that they are, that, 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 that even the norms within institutions are favorable um, to women? So I guess the, uh, the next the next. Um, phase of research for you all, it's really critically thinking about um, how do we change norms at scale, but also how do we know that norms have changed? How do we get to that critical point when we start mm. seeing large scale norm change? We cannot do this a village at a time. We are not going to be able to do this a woman at a time. We've got to figure out how we do this at, um, at, uh, at scale. Thank you so much for having me um, and back to you, Esther. Thank you so much, Jemima, for giving us such powerful uh, opening remarks and asking very critical question. And for the case studies that we have, I'm sure we are going to get some of the answers to some of the questions and some of the questions that we don't handle, I think we'll come back to them during the policy discussion. Our first case study is on the public-private partnership for artificial insemination delivery, uh, female AI technicians experience in Ethiopia that will be presented to us by Consolata Kavisha. And I'm very honored and happy to introduce Ms. Consolata, who is working as a monitoring evaluation and learning manager at Venture 37, and she is based in Tanzania. Uh, Consolata, kindly take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, as has been introduced, I'll be presenting a case of a female air technician experience in Ethiopia and a public-private partnership project. Next slide, please. Well, uh, the paid project was initiated uh, as a means to uh, improve animal production and performance in terms of uh, milk production and productivity in Ethiopia. So that was the rationale for the, uh, the launching of uh, uh, the project in Ethiopia. And also uh, one of the strategies was also to address the challenge of 
uh, fewer women air technicians who are providing services. Next slide, please. Well, the project has three common components and was uh, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates was implemented in two countries, Tanzania, it ended in October 2020, and in Ethiopia, and it is ending this year, November. Uh, the project's main goal was to address the uh, air technician performance, increase farmer demand for air services, and also improve uh, production of semen. With all this in mind, the project was uh, addressing I uh, was reaching about 150 women air technicians and also plan to train over uh, 80,000 uh, 80, women farmers to adopt and use air, air services. In Ethiopia, before the start of the project, we had only about 2% of the air technicians who are women. And by the end of the project, we were able to train and equip over 118 percent women a technician, which now we contributed to over 275 percent of the uh, AI technician base in Ethiopia. Uh, the retention base for the women a technician who remain active is over 50 percent, and the uh, top performer AI technician is able to perform about 125 insemination per month uh, compared to the male AI technician the who, uh, top performer who is doing less than that. And to date, as I'm presenting, over 12,000 improved curves has been born, resulting from the uh, work done by women a technician. Next slide, please. So uh, today I'll be presenting to you with her consent, uh, Store from one of the best performer women air technician by name Demakech. She, she joined the project at 19 years old, just after graduating her high school. She was an ambitious girl uh, who grew up, grew up in a male dominated society. Uh, but when she saw an opportunity for this uh, 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 job of becoming a women air technician, she was ambitious and she applied for the post. Um, at the end, now when the selection was being done, Demeket was almost the last one to apply. She uh, was the 957 applica applicant, and she she came up the first one as the selection was run uh, based on her qualification and other merits. So, um, unfortunately, when the results were out, the second person who was the male was not happy that uh, a woman was selected to be trained as a, a, a technician. So he filed a complaint that uh, artificial insemination delivery work is for men. No woman is supposed to do that. But Demekes now has to fight for her position. She went ahead and called the bureau who are doing the selection for the uh, air technician to be trained and presented her case and lucky enough, she was listened and now she was considered for the training. Next slide, please. Now for Demekes to be a, a good AI technician performer, her journey was not easy. She was getting some comments like, um, this is a male job, like uh, becoming a, an AI technician as a female is a shame to the community. And also, um, how comes a woman can do a technician? But all this did not make the market not to push hard to become a best performer as a female air technician. Uh, also, uh, some of the strategies that help her to be successful was now when she started engaging with farmers and from the training that was provided to her through the project, all this built her confidence and skills and how she should approach farmers to uh, get a good and positive uh, attitude from them. Now, with all this, the farmers that she got her, the cows uh, inseminated by her, when the cows became pregnant, now they started becoming the ambassadors for her work. And also some farmers went ahead and thought like, 
Now she's a woman A technician. When my car is inseminated by her, uh, I'll get a female a, a female calf. So all this uh, was now some of the things that made or oh, is her pathway to become a successful woman A technician. Next slide, please. Well, uh, to get Demeket as a successful woman A technician, she has a message to other woman A technician who are struggling to uh, achieve their best in the field. Uh, she's, uh, she's, she's telling them not, not to be ashamed of their job and she should not, they should be following the procedures to achieve best results. Now the results will now set them in the feed. Also, she wants to tell the woman farmers that uh, they are the one who take care of the cows so they should inform other farmers and their husband about the AI services and the success about AI services. Next slide, please. What, what do we learn as a project as we implemented this, uh, this, this project? That the program should understand the gender barriers at program design and also interventions that programs are, are intending to do should focus on women participation Understanding that women play the key role in livestock management and uptake of technology. Also, women are more resilient and strive for result-based performance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Consolata, for that wonderful presentation. We now move from Ethiopia and cross over to Ghana, where we will get our second case study on transforming the vaccine delivery system for chickens and goats in Ghana what approaches and what benefits for women. I'm privileged to be presenting two amazing women. Uh, one is Agnes Loriba, who is a team leader at CARE in Ghana, working on food and water systems and climate change portfolio. And she's also the interim head of programs for the country office. We also have uh, Sharifa, uh, Sharifa, Sh Sh Sherry Fatu Tijani, sorry about that, uh, who is a 24-year-old veterinary technician in one of the uh, districts where she's working under the project. And they're going to be sharing with us their experience with norms that they are working with in Western, in Upper West region of Ghana. Welcome, Agnes. Okay, thank you very much, um, Esther, for the introduction. I think you have introduced uh, our research projects already, uh, transforming the vaccine delivery system for chicken and goats uh, in Ghana, what approaches and what benefits for women. Uh, the, the team has christened this project, uh, the Women Rare um, Project. So this, on this project, we are um, in a consortium with ILRI, uh, Cow Tribe Technology, um, which is a Ghanaian-based um, social enterprise providing digitalized um, vaccine delivery um, services to farmers in rural locations. Uh, this is a project under the Livestock Vaccine Innovation Fund, uh, funded by IDRC, uh, Global Affairs Canada, and the Gates Foundation. We are researching into understanding what it takes to transform um, the vaccine delivery system um, such that vaccine delivery benefits both female livestock keepers and female animal health service uh, providers in rural Ghana. This project is implemented in the East region of Ghana, um, specifically in two districts the Bapu West and the Kusiga districts. We've been implementing this project since um, 2019 and it runs till uh, March, 2023. We can go to the next slide, please. So on this um, project and related to the team for this uh, webinar today, we are working on three um, specific objectives. And one of these objectives really sets well with the team for uh, this webinar. So on the third objective for the project, we are um, researching into identifying um, the capabilities of women uh, that need um, to be supported 
as in building capacity. And then also understanding um, the gender norms. So norms that affect both livestock keepers and then uh, women who work as service providers in, in the sector um, to ensure that um, vaccine service delivery benefits um, all. And um, over the past three um, years working on this project, engaging communities and stakeholders, there are three key norms um, that have come up um, that we will be discussing during um, this webinar this afternoon. The first is um, the institutional norm uh, related to hiring of female vets and positioning them in such um, rural districts or rural locations um, where there's need. So for this norm, um, we look at how even females get um, interested and motivated to get trained as vet technicians and how uh, at the institutional level, we ensure that um, they are um, positioned in the right um, locations to um, enable service delivery to female farmers. There are also norms um, related to uh, the female vet's ability uh, to interact. So these norms affect um, female vet's ability to, to interact with both male and female farmers. And then uh, the third key norm is also related to restrictions um, around um, female farmers' ability to interact in the livestock market interact um, as in the ability to sell livestock directly and even also to purchase. And these affect um, their motivation to invest in the um, livestock production. So uh, my colleague Sharifa will speak a bit more about how these uh, norms affect her day-to-day -day life as a vet technician. Uh, and so on the, on the next slide, we can go to the next slide. So on the next slide, on the slide, um, we are just sharing a bit around. Let's go back to the to the previous slide. Yes. So um, sharing a bit around how we have been uh, addressing these three key uh, norms I uh, have highlighted. So the first related to um, availability of female vets and how um, we understand the value of having um, females active and benefiting in this sector. As a project, we have invested in recruiting and um, posting two female vet technicians through Cal Tribe, the private vet company we have as a member of um, the consortium. Um, influenced by the principle um, of the project that having female vets um, would potentially increase access to vaccines by um, female livestock keepers. And so we needed to have female vets on the ground to be able to test this and use the evidence to engage um, government to invest better in having female vets on the ground. On um, social norms in the communities, uh, we have used uh, the social analysis and action um, approach, which is a community-led um, approach um, by working with men, women, traditional leaders to question, um, reflect, and take some actions on uh, norms that have been determined to negatively affect um, community members. And in this case, uh, we have specific examples related to women's ability to market um, their goods, chicken and other uh, livestock. So we have such dialogues uh, and sessions in communities, uh, bringing on board, board both men and women and working with communities to question these norms. Um, building in these uh, reflective sessions, examples from similar locations um, nearby about um, the empowering effect of women's ability to engage um, in the livestock markets and what that means for women's um, uh, motivation and profitability, empowerments. So in this case, we have um, used specific examples about women being able to market their pigs in neighboring locations and providing opportunity for communities to learn from these 
um, experiences and taking action from these examples. Uh, we do also have dialogues with male and female um, vet technicians. We do understand that before we get to the level of having um, the number of female vets that are needed in the system, we also need the male uh, gender, the male um, vet technicians to be aware and take um, very conscious action related to the norms and how they affect their um, service delivery and targeting of uh, female livestock keepers. So at this point, uh, we will hear from Sharifa Tijani, uh, who is a vet technician on the project. Uh, due to Sharifa's location, she's uh, not able to present live, but we do have a video recording of her presentation and um, she's online and is happy to respond to any specific questions. I am a woman with a technician working in Boko West District in the Upper East Region of Ghana. I'm not mostly posted by government to such locations. I was hired privately by the Women Rare Project. I've been working on the project for the past two years. I realized that beside my skills, there were cultural beliefs that I had to overcome. Most farmers, especially men, didn't trust that I could restrain them to vaccinate them. I also quickly learned that men and women in these communities believe that if a woman was menstruating and she got into the good crowd or the chicken pen, the animals were going to die and the eggs wouldn't hatch. Cultural norms in this community barred women from taking livestock to the trading centers. They sold their livestock only to their husbands or male relatives. Women were not interested in vaccinating their livestock because they had limited control over the income from the sales of the livestock. Without reaching women farmers, then my work wouldn't attain the equality and empowerment goal we were hoping for. The project supported us by having gender dialogue sessions with men and women questioning these cultural beliefs and asking community members to reflect on those norms, their negative outcome, and how the community would support change. I am observing some positive change in my daily work. I, I am accepted as a female veterinary technician a lot more now than in the beginning. Men and women farmers call me to go and vaccinate their goats or chicken and pay for their services. I have not had an incident where animals died because I went into a crowd or a pen during my menstruation. I have witnessed men supporting and allowing their wives to bring their goats for vaccination in the evening and because I'm a woman vet, there were no fears of sexual harassment of their women. I have heard of some parents who are now encouraging their daughters to study the specialized in veterinary. I feel happy in my role in contributing to shifting norms as this community changes their beliefs. I trust that we are seeing small changes that will one day be a big change and the role of women vets will be a lot more prominent and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes and uh, uh, Sharifa for that presentation from Ghana. And now we are shifting gears a little bit and we are going to be inviting Vicky. We are so privileged to have Vicky with us in the panel. And Vicky is coming to us from the uh, Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Agricultural Development Team. And she is responsible for the Women's Empowerment Portfolio. And in addition to managing grants aimed at empowering women in farming households and agribusinesses, she works closely with foundation teams for nutrition, crops, livestock, markets, data, and policy. So we are so happy to have you, Vicky. Kindly take it away. Well, thank you, Esther, and thank you, Jemima, and the whole Erie team. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, empowering women and livestock value chains is a very high priority in our agriculture team, as you're hearing from many examples here today. We work closely with ILRI on a number of initiatives in this space. 
and solving for breaking the biases that hold back the lives of women and girls is, of course, um, a top priority of our entire foundation. And I wanted to um, share with you a small story. I was in a meeting um, with Bill Gates a few years ago, and he, he challenged us. He was like, you know, how do we get these norms to change? You know, how do we get those productivity out outcomes, income outcomes, nutrition outcomes, when, when the, the, the social norms hold, you know, make it challenging. And I started telling him about this great example we had in Bihar, India, where we were working with women's goatery, um, to the point where he sent his film crew to uh, film uh, this project. And next slide. Um, I wanted to play this for you. It's three minutes, but I, I do think we're out of time. So I just want to um, encourage you all to get online and see this beautiful um, uh, film about the Pashusakis, the, the women who provide animal health care services uh, to landless women's goats in uh, Bihar, India. Next slide. And from uh, the point of view of policy, you know, and, and implications of learning and how to take this all to scale, I would say one of the key points is partnership. Um, as Jemima brought this up, we've partnered with GalvMed for the curriculum with Hester and Brilliant Biopharma to help us solve the uh, video, the vaccine value chains with the NARS to bring in the improved box. And through the market analysis, the next step is not only to have healthcare uh, delivery through these amazing women, but also to establish a woman-run goat meat company because there is huge demand uh, for Black Bengal uh, goat meat. Next slide. So how do we know if we're shifting the social norms or not? Um, there was a slide before. And I just wanna say that we, we track uh, very carefully. Um, one of the norms that had to change very quickly was mobility. Women in these communities often do not leave their household and this constrains all market interaction. And so we have built in the PROWEA into the annual outcome uh, uh, surveys um, so we are tracking and we can see slowly, slowly, carefully, this is five years results, that women's mobility is changing. Uh, each of the Pashu Sakis is providing services to 120 to 200 different households. Next slide. And very importantly is, are they improving their, uh, their incomes? And this is almost never collected in um, a, a lot of livestock investments. Are women's incomes improving? Um, it's hard work to collect this data, but we can see gradual increases. The incomes are still fairly small, but in these homes, um, this is in many cases, the second largest source of income in these households. And it will grow as the meat company gets established. Next slide. And the gold standard to whether or not we know uh, the social norms are shifting, are, of course, are women's decision making. And as you can see here, are, are, is, are, do they have more decision making over the benefits of that income, over the benefits of this um, value chain? And um, this is very important to track. Next slide. So, Basically, for policymakers and investors, some of the lessons that we are learning is, first of all, recognize women's priorities as market opportunities. All too often, poor women's animals are not a priority for market investments. For example, in Bihar, landless women's goats are not, were not recognized as a priority for any veterinary services. The Department of Animal Husbandry had nothing for these women's animals. And we also vice versa, recognize market opportunities as opportunities for women. Um, what I really like about the case studies that we just saw is that not only are women seen as clients 
uh, for livestock services, but as the service providers for livestock services. Um, and this gets to my second point. We need to solve not only for women's equitable participation in livestock opportunities, but for their equitable value capture, their income, their profit, their revenue. We have to be tracking these together. To do that well, of course, you have to do some really solid gender analysis. Um, livestock value chains offer women some of their best options for income and for diversification. When livestock uh, uh, are integrated with their horticulture or their agroforestry or their cropping, it really increases uh, their resilience in times of shock. And so this is essential. And it's some of the best outcomes for nutrition. Though we can't assume the nutrition we, we've, we're learning this. We're finding that women may be producing the birds and producing the eggs, producing the goats, the dairy, but not consuming it because they still can't afford it. They produce it and they sell it to meet other needs. And we need to get the production up to a level where they're not only selling to meet their basic needs, but also have enough to consume. And to get there, we have to bundle. We need to have the technical, the financial, the markets work, and the social norms work. So in our Pashusaki example, for um, we have a whole uh, women's rights, women's empowerment NGO tied in with the uh, markets training. So they get technical training in animal health, but they also get the women's empowerment and women's rights training right alongside it. And we find that's the combination that makes a transformative difference. And how do we get there? We get there by investing in innovative partnerships. So private sector alone usually can't deliver the kinds of outcomes and social norm changes we want to see, but they're essential for sustainability and scale. But when we partner them with an NGO that does have that community relationship, that has the toolkit for working on the gender sensitive gender issues with both the men and women, then we find powerful change. And we've got to document that, of course, by sex, age, income, and the other intersectionalities as relevant to each context. In our drive for scale, we we find it very valuable to start with women's groups, women's platforms, and then partner up uh, with the private sector or government and to be patient, to set realistic timelines. And I'm going to end with a, um, a note to say how difficult this is and how challenging it is, as well as this program's going in Bihar. Um, the COVID uh, pandemic just hit so very hard. Our project manager died of COVID. Um, as a frontline worker. And um, the young woman who is the Pashu Saki that stars in the film, I really would love for you to go and see that. Um, with the lockdown, their mobility was restricted. They couldn't get the income and therefore their families started to go hungry. The government made some food subsidies available. And as the Pashu Saki went to collect the food subsidy that she was absolutely entitled to, she was beaten and she was beaten so badly they broke her leg. And I'm happy to say she has healed. She's back out there. She's delivering the services again, but it was just a very hard reminder how challenging this work is. And therefore I just wanna say everyone here, and there's a lot of you here today, everyone here, we need to be as an intentional, as we can. This is hard work. Thank you and back to you. Thank you so much, Vicky. And you end with a very strong message there. And I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of uh, some of the project uh, ad administrators in India. And this is the reality of the challenge and the situation that we are in. And even to imagine that somebody is beating up a woman and breaking her leg, those are maybe indications of norms that are also challenging. And because we have had uh, a, a lot of policy messages from your talk and a lot of policy messages from Jemima, maybe I'm going to skip my questions and I will share them with you maybe in another 
opportunity. And I want to welcome Alessandra to give us a two minute uh, wrap up. And the question that I'm asking Alessandra is, what do you hear when you listen to these case studies, when you listen to Jemima, when you listen to Vicky? Uh, just to mention that Alessandra is my team leader here at Ilri, she's the one that is leading the gender team. So Alessandra, what are you hearing? Thank you so much, Esther, and hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm super excited to be here and to be listening to all these incredible experiences. So what I've heard, I've heard um, that the livestock sector is offering an, incre an incredible amount of opportunities for um, women in particular to get out of poverty and improve their nutrition security. And we also know that women are two thirds of the poor livestock keepers. But then again, what we have seen is that women do a lot of the work and that when they, it is about you know, getting the benefits, they rarely uh, enjoy those benefits. So I've heard that when women try to get into livestock business specifically, they basically enter a male space with very strong norms that discriminate against women. This happens at recruitment. So in both case studies, we've seen that both women and men have the same degree, they are vets. However, in Ghana, there were no women in the public system as vets uh, in the regions where we work. And in Ethiopia, only 2% of AI technicians were women. And also, <clears throat> women seem to really need to fight for their job. I thought it was incredible, the story of Demeketch, who actually, <laughs> she, had, she had won the position and then somebody uh, said that, uh, you know, this is a job for men, it's not a job for women. And she really had to fight uh, to get her job and you know she was very courage courageous to do so and she found support and also what I find striking is that a lot of these norms are rarely so you know clearly um, spelled out that you can pinpoint them very often they are subtle and very hard to you know to identify and to, to publicly um, condemn um, but I also see that women in livestock business face a lot of uh, challenges when they get into the job itself. So once they have overcome the difficulties of getting the job, then they fa face more norms in the job. So they face norms from colleagues and the clients. So we heard again from Sharifa that um, the farmers generally believe that women cannot restrain animals. And as a vet, of course, that is a problem. And also the belief that menstruating women will actually, you know, if they enter a pen, they will kill the animals. So, you know, real challenges to performing effectively as a vet. And we've also seen like in the case of uh, Demikic that they need to really super perform to be able to uh, be accepted in the job. You know, she had to really go well beyond the normal performance for people to actually trust her. But I also heard a lot about what we can do, and that's, I think, very important and very encouraging. I've heard that at community level, we can look for opportunities to uh, exploit and leverage the existing norms. So if women farmers are, are discouraged from interacting with male vets, well, perfect, let's hire women vets who can interact with women farmers, as again in the case of Sharifa. Um, I've also seen that uh, engaging communities and decision makers intentionally to really question and change these norms is an effective strategy for equitable value capture, as Vicky was saying. And I've also heard that it is very important that we also address the systemic discrimination. So go beyond the communities, but also work with policymakers and the structural discrimination. And um, Jemima talked about creating accountability mechanisms for organizations and institutions in food systems for gender equality, of course. The universal care being part of fiscal policies, but also systems to guarantee equal access to and control over access uh, resources and technologies. And of course, they need to engage men at all levels as agents of change and as you know, practical <laughs> uh, agents of uh, you know, social dynamics and gender norms. So what I think is beautiful to see is that change is needed and change is possible. I've seen the increase, 275% increase in women AI technicians that Consolata mentioned, incredible. And I've also seen the statistics that Vicky shared on decision-making, on mobility, on income. And finally, I've also seen Sharifa saying that uh, she's become a model for future generations. Parents are talking about being a vet as a possible future for their daughters. So 
wonderful messages of hope, wonderful messages to, you know, really of things we can do in practice and engage with. And of course, more research needed to be done to understand better how norms change and how do we monitor that change. So again, thank you so much. Very inspiring presentations. Look forward to continuing the discussions and the work together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you so much, Alessandra, for that great summary. And I apologize to all of us that we've gone over by one minute. And I kindly want to request to your uh, patience, even as we thank our presenters for taking their time to organize their thoughts, uh, to give us slides, and to give us really wonderful words. And there's a lot that we can do together. And I think this is a conversation we should have again and again. The issues of social norms are integral to our social and gender transformative work. I thank my colleagues who prepared in this webinar and uh, all the ones that have signed in as participants. Without you, we would not have had this successful meeting. We thank you so much for being part of this evening. Uh, have a great evening and all the best as you finish your day or as you start your day. Have a great evening. Thank you so much.